Uh, thanks to Ahmad and uh, Matthew for, for this great event so far. Um, and all the other people have helped uh, organize it. So it's, it's been great, and I've been excited to learn about all the new stuff happening in serverless. Um, and I try to keep on top of it, but it's just moving so fast. So it's, it's great to see it happen in, in real time. Um, so I, you know, just like a bunch of other speakers, I also started my career with PHP about 17 years ago and uh, ran New York PHP meetups for over a decade at IBM in Midtown. Um, today I'm going to talk about serverless with Apache OpenWhisk. Um, which is the open source project behind IBM's functions as a service or serverless platform, uh, which has been rebranded as of this week to IBM Cloud Functions. Uh, it used to be IBM Open oh, uh, OpenWhisk on IBM Bluemix. Um, I'll give you an introduction to uh, OpenWhisk and do a couple demos of um, uh, some sample apps, how you get started working with OpenWhisk and how you might uh, do that on top of Cloud Functions. And uh, I already posted slides and sample apps up on GitHub, um, so you can pull those down right now if you want and kind of follow along. Okay, so, um, so we've seen this abstraction away from bare metal um, over the last few years, and these new serverless platforms like OpenWhisk and Lambda are helping developers focus more and more on the core logic of what they're building. Um, uh, rather than the supporting infrastructure around them. Um, and as you saw from one of the earlier talks today from uh, Keith, I believe it was, uh, that's helping developer velocity, um, developing things faster and faster. So uh, the term serverless um, is merged as that, 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 that phrase for the deployment model um, because that developer point of view is shifting away from all the operations. Um, and that going along with the fact that code is not always running at all. So I happen to like that term. I know it's controversial. I know that people prefer different terms like functions as a service. Um, but there's a whole developer experience that goes along that's beyond just the code and the functions. Um, and I like the work. I saw Chris working on some definitions for what serverless is and um, hope to work together with him in the Cloud Native Computing Foundation serverless working group to help people understand this in kind of a more standardized way help them understand what it's capable of, what it's good for, what it's not good for. Okay, and one of the, the, the key nice things about serverless is that it's helping uh, developers build well-designed cloud-native applications that adhere to the 12-factor the best practices that you saw before. So what serverless does for developers, it's, it's offloading all of those operational focused things that are in the 12 factors, um, mainly around scaling, life cycle, and um, uh, workload concurrency, which really can get out of hand um, as you start to go all in on microservices, where um, you can see how it quickly moves from uh, breakdown to just your microservices into uh, the operational focusing, focuses there about making them HA and, and making sure that they're, they're always available in different regions. Uh, so beyond those, uh, those common HTTP microservices, uh, those workloads that were commonly on infrastructure as a service and platform as a service, uh, the other great thing that's happening uh, for serverless architectures is it's um, providing a platform for different workloads that were non-HTTP that weren't really served by those other models in the past. So uh, that includes um, handling database changes, events happening when um, files are dropped in object storage, um, IoT messages, the huge volume of those, the small um, non-HTTP protocols such as MQTT that are happening. Um, the not so performance important asynchronous communication models that you see with bots. Um, performance tends not to be a huge um, part of that experience when you're trying to have a natural interface between a user and, and, and some cognitive intelligence. Um, and of course, uh, batch type jobs, things where code only needs to run maybe five minutes a day. Uh, there's a lot of great great ways to um, um, cut your costs in that, in that way. And uh, of course, those auto-scaled API backends and uh, things that back mobile applications. Um, and one of, the, one of the, beyond that auto-scale, a lot of people are looking at this is just a straight, it's just cheaper to do. Um, the cost model um, always appears um, very attractive when you're saying I'm only being billed for the milliseconds that code is running. Um, but beyond just that cost aspect, which, you know, there's, there's other things that are more expensive in development, I think the key aspect of that is that you're able to, um, the developer's able to deploy code much quicker, um, so you have 
um, you're getting more out of your developer time. And another interesting point that Simon Wardley uh, pointed out around the, um, the model that's, that may be emerging with serverless architectures is that your developers are now more tight, closely tied to the business applications they're helping support or build, right? So the, the value that your company is getting out of running an application on a serverless architecture is more directly tied now to the cost it takes to run and the, and the resources you apply there. So um, beyond just the cost, there's lots of other great implications of that. Um, and of course, um, they're not a silver bullet, right? Y there's, there's great use cases, but um, many more types of anti-patterns to worry about as well. So we'll see how those, those, um, those hash out in the coming um, months and, and years. Um, so how do you actually get started building serverless applications um, and, and take advantage of those capabilities of scale and cost? So um, IBM started working on Apache OpenWhisk about 20 months ago, um, and it's been in production on our cloud um, called uh, OpenWhisk on IBM Bluemix since last December, um, and with the rename now Cloud Functions. So what makes it different really from other public hosted alternatives is that um, it's extensible to any runtime that you want to use. Um, there's a bunch of top level languages, but uh, it's got a model where you can run anything you want on it, um, any binary. Um, it integrates with a variety of internal uh, data sources, um, event sources, not just things coming from within that particular cloud it's hosted on. Um, it has a model that it can take internal and external um, event sources and bind to those. Um, and it can be deployed in various different uh, models. Obviously, as a serverless platform, you want to consume it as the end user to get the benefits, but if you want the flexibility, um, it can be deployed out on different um, clouds. Uh, so along with getting the advantages of working with the serverless architecture, you, you do have to consider that you're going to be learning about a new programming model. So there's a bit of a learning curve that's going to apply no matter what you do. Um, and I'll get into the, the programming model behind OpenWhisk a little later here. Later here. Um, and of course, behind any serverless platform, there's actually servers running, right? You, the developer, again, going to that point of view, doesn't see it, but behind the scenes, and this is especially evident in an open source project, um, there's a bunch of components out there, distributed architecture based on open source technology. So things that are already proven and already well adopted in the community. So OpenWhisk isn't itself completely brand new from the ground up, it builds on the shoulders of giants. So um, Apache CouchDB, Nginx, uh, Console's actually going away, we're using service discovery a different way, uh, Kafka for high performance messaging and streaming, and um, of course Docker, um, and even below those levels, uh, such as ContainerD. Um, and you can run this particular system on top of a cluster of servers, right? If you are a serverless provider to other end users, you might deploy it on top of virtual machines or bare metal um, or a mix of both. Um, as a developer, if you're interested in contributing to the core platform, you can run it in a vagrant in Docker containers on your own workstation. And uh, since Red Hat's joined the community, um, they've helped us also drive forward the support for OpenWhisk on top of Kubernetes. Um, they're, they're looking to use it as part of their, their OpenShift strategy. And uh, there's beyond Red Hat, uh, there's a whole bunch of um, companies um, that are joining the ecosystem. So there's, there's people that are Apache committers, like the folks from Red Hat, uh, from uh, Adobe, from IBM, and, and other folks. Um, and there's a community growing that's contributing uh, requests uh, and, and packages, things like that through the Slack channel, through the mailing list and the Apache process. And um, there's a bunch of interesting startups working on end user solutions and um, other companies like Cisco that are providing integrations um, for, for some routing that they're doing in, in edge use cases and uh, Kong providing a different plugin for a different API gateway besides the one we use on, on Bluemix, uh, things like that. And uh, there's a whole set of new tools um, emerging as well. So. Um, there's support for the serverless framework with OpenWhisk. Uh, that's new as of about six months ago, um, and that's constantly evolving. Um, there's also a whole bunch of new tools out there for testing your functions locally outside of an OpenWhisk context, and also um, doing things in a more visual manner using a different uh, domain-specific language for working with the programming model. So growing fast. 
Um, for that end user, um, beyond the person interested maybe in, in what's going on behind the scenes, the fastest way to really get started and play with the technology is to um, go sign up for Bluemix and um, basically you, you sign in for the account there and you download a CLI or you work with um, a bunch of uh, integrated tools as well. Okay, um, so if you do want to follow along with any of the demos that are in the GitHub repo, um, one thing that can be a little bit confusing as we do the name change. Um, the CLI is, is the way I interact with, with OpenWhisk on Bluemix for the most part. Um, there's two options for a CLI. Uh, there's one which is the, the WSK binary itself, and then there's a, an umbrella CLI for all Bluemix services. It's the BX tool. So WISC is a plug-in to that, as is Cloud Foundry, as is kubectl um, for other things. So I tend to use just the raw um, WSK CLI. So if you want to download that and check it out. Okay, so um, as I said, you know, OpenWhisk, the core is open source. Um, what IBM does for its service is that we have a bunch of um, developer-friendly tools for handling some of the, the key concerns around serverless. So that's kind of um, composing workflows, um, uh, hooking up actions to data and kind of testing things out in kind of a, 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 a GUI interface. Um, there's also monitoring, uh, so you can check out the performance of as your code is running. Uh, you can see the cold starts, how much you're being billed for it from the cold start, and then successive calls. Uh, for this particular run, it was, uh, took about 800 milliseconds the first time um, to compile and, and, and run, and then after that, um, uh, much faster. Maybe not on that screenshot, but Usually it's 10 times faster, you see. And then there's um, a visual monitoring console. So of course you can use um, the open source tools and, and look at the logging uh, output there in a, in a CLI, but um, there's a nice visual way to um, see the success, the cost um, model of how, what you can improve as you, as you develop your functions, as you make them more efficient. Um, you can debug um, particular uh, functions that may have failed or, or see the payload of what was passed through from one asynchronous action to another, right? So um, as, as a developer, sometimes it's difficult, you know, you're, instead of dealing with a synchronous model of a stack trace, uh, you're dealing with a bunch of asynchronous calls, and this is a great way to just correlate um, what called what, what it got from another action, things like that. Okay, and um, one of the, the recent things that we've, we've added to Cloud Functions on top of um, our cloud is an in included API gateway. And what makes this different from other providers is it's actually integrated right into OpenWhisk. And so the cost for your functions includes the cost for the API gateway. They're not two separate pricing models. Um, it's the same, I think, four zeros, 17 um, percentage of a cent per, per millisecond cost model. But it's all a single bill. Um, so, and, and it's, a pretty, it's a pretty nice API gateway service, gateway service. It includes all the things you would expect, right? The rate limiting, uh, the security integration with OAuth, and uh, cross-origin resource sharing um, built in there. Okay, um, so let's look at the core of, of OpenWhisk itself. Um, we spoke about, you know, if, if there's, a, there's a new programming model that developers are working with. Um, so this is, they're gonna be coming familiar with four different terms. Uh, packages, triggers, actions, and rules. Uh, those are the, the, the key high-level concepts. And uh, packages are a way to capture triggers and actions in a sort of namespace. A uh, nice little uh, way to, to group different functions that are related to different microservices or different data sources. So uh, there's a bunch of um, packages out there. Um, those can provide input or, um, input or output um, type of uh, interfaces. And those emit triggers, um, which are then uh, mapped to an action that should take an action based on that trigger uh, through a rule, and then you get an output. Those triggers um, can be a whole bunch of things. As I mentioned, it's not just HTTP requests anymore that are really quite interesting for these new workloads. Uh, you've got things like uh, Slack bots, you've got webhooks from GitHub, um, data changes, message streams, things like that, IoT device readings that are coming in over MQTT, um, uh, and of course, you know, regular 
mobile type of use cases as well that do have some sort of web connections as well. And the code that you're actually writing to respond to those events, those event handlers, those functions are known as actions in the OpenWhisk context. And those can be written in um, um, a bunch of top level languages. So there's, there's top tier support for JavaScript, Python, Java, and Swift, and PHP as of just a couple weeks ago. That was our first community con contributed runtime. Um, so it's kind of funny, it's, it's still relevant and it actually comes from uh, someone who's pretty, pretty well embedded in the PHP community, so it's not just a, a bolt-on. He actually has included a lot of the really cool stuff that comes out of PHP 7.1 and 7.2. Um, so that's great to see that that immediately went from the community into what we're hosting on our platform. And all of these languages, um, they have the same function signature. Uh, it looks pretty similar to other um, serverless platforms. What is different is we generally only take in one dictionary, uh, a, a hash map or a, an, an associative array of parameters, and that includes everything, and that also has some environment variables that are available in it uh, in the context as well. But basically, um, you take input and you return back um, a JSON object, and you can do that synchronously or asynchronously. So it looks the same for all those top-level languages, but if, if that's not what you know, is going to be enough for you, you can actually take anything and drop it inside of a Docker image, and as long as you implement a, a, a little shim to respond to what OpenWhisk is expecting as an interface, you can package anything in there. Uh, one of the use cases I did recently with this was taking the Tesseract uh, Optical Character Recognition Library, a C library, um, packaging that within a Docker image, uh, putting a little shim around it, and I use that for image recognition, just high performance type stuff. Um, actions can also be associated in, in um, groups um, uh, with that declarative model of the rules. Uh, you, can, you can group things, um, you, can, you can invoke one action from another directly, uh, you can have that happen asynchronously through a data source, um, and you can, you can compose things in different ways, so build different workflows, reuse things such as if you have an action that sends an email alert, um, you know, reuse that in a different context. Uh, so there's a bunch of new uh, pr um, concepts built, being built there, um, including sequences. There's something new called combinators, um, which are kind of built-in uh, like logic that you can build upon. And uh, again, the rules, right? The rules can be uh, put together in a many-to-many -many fashion. So the same um, event source, the same trigger can invoke lots of different other actions, um, and the same action can be triggered by many different um, triggers as well. Um, and that final concept, right, packages are, are a way to put a namespace around uh, triggers and actions. So if you created a particular um, um, interface for like uh, MySQL, if you wanted to add that as a, a database source, um, you as a third party developer could create a package and share that with the ecosystem. Um, there's ones that are built into the Bluemix platform, such as Watson and Weather Data. And then there's ones that are available out of the box in the open source project. But basically, as you, as you consume an open WISC system, it's going to have an ecosystem of packages built in, but you can generally also install your own. Okay. All right, so uh, let's take a look at what actually happens um, when you've created your actions here. So um, I'm going to focus on, on using the CLI for a lot of these demos. Um, I'll, I'll try to call back to, to the Bluemix platform where, where it makes sense. Um, but uh, that's the core part of, the, of working with the open source Apache OpenWhisk is, is using the CLI. Um, I also tend to you know, work with Atom on my local machine um, when, I'm, when I'm developing actions for the syntax highlighting just for Java, JavaScript uh, or just the shell itself. But um, essentially what, what happens after you've written your, your actions is you will have um, uploaded them to the OpenWhisk engine. OpenWhisk will take the source code for that action and store it in a database where it just, it's just waiting for something to happen. It's not started up immediately when you upload it. It's just waiting there at no cost because it's just sitting in a database. Um, and then as you map your action to a trigger as a data source, what OpenWhisk will do is pull that source code, um, inject it into a Docker a running Docker container in a pool that's available for that SDK, execute it, and then pause it, right? So if you're the same user 
um, and your code is being hit several times, you're going to sometimes reuse that container, generally within five minutes. Um, so you can kind of do some fun tricks with cold starts and, and um, warming things up. Um, but that container is only shared for your API key, no one else. Um, so again, the code is pulled out. It'll auto scale in response to at each of the triggers being fired, be that an API call, be that some event um, auto scaled on your behalf and managing the whole container lifecycle. Okay, so let's look at the first one here. Um, this is probably the simplest possible thing you could do with OpenWhisk, um, and it, it shows you those key concepts. So uh, what I'm going to do here is first I'm going to start up a uh, polling process for the logs. I'll do that in one terminal window, and then I'll work through uploading this main function as an action named handler, and then I can kind of unit test it directly on OpenWhisk by invoking it with a blocking uh, parameter to kind of synchronously interact with it, see if I'm getting the right output, and checking the, uh, the, the log to see that I'm getting my, the, the right output there as well. Then I'll create a trigger. This one here is based on a package, an alarm package, um, which is given a cron uh, pattern to fire it um, every 20 seconds for, for um, uh, 15 times. So it'll go for five minutes. And then those things exist independently until I create a rule, which I'll logically call invoke periodically, um, and then uh, just do the mapping. So go there. Okay, and again, I've got all these samples linked from uh, uh, my last name, Crook, function 17. So let's look at that, um, that first one, action, open whisk action trigger rule. Um, so I've got my action, my whisk activation poll. So let's go to the shell. Um, let's look at that. Oops. And that sets up a WebSocket to, uh, to OpenWhisk, um, the streaming server for the logs. And then I've already checked out this repo here. So I'm going to now upload um, handler.js. And that's just, just that main function with some comments. So action create, name it handler, take the handler file. Great. And do whisk list. And I'll see that I've got um, handler up there. There's some, there's some default resources created here by Bluemix, and, and I'll get to what this clouded binding is here, but using whisk list, you'll see those, those programming model concepts of package, package actions, triggers, and rules. Okay, so it's uploaded, it's there. What I'll do now is kind of unit test it, or, you know, just interact with it uh, outside, just manually, right? Um, so I'm going to invoke it, and the response here, my result JSON uh, it's giving me the current timestamp, uh, UTC timestamp. So that was kind of the console log bit. I'm sorry, that's, that's the return value from the main function is here. And that happened synchronously in the way I interacted with it. Um, and then over in the whisk activation log, um, anytime something happens within OpenWhisk, it gets a correlation ID, a, a whisk activation ID. And so this is what I did with console log. So return value and then also debugging stuff. Okay, so um, now the next step is to create that trigger. Uh, again, it's, it's every 20 seconds, do it a maximum of 15 times. So, in here, yes. Okay, success, created my trigger. Uh, you can see um, it now is uh, the alarm package um, and this trigger here is going to go just every 20 seconds. Um, that's just going to do its own thing, right? Even so sometimes one of the, the tough parts of debugging is, you know, you set up an event source, but you haven't quite mapped it yet, and it may stop doing whatever it was doing before you get a chance to do the mapping. So if I forgot to link it back up in five minutes, um, I will have missed that opportunity. Okay. So let's create that rule, do our mapping. Whisk list. Yep. So I got my handler, my trigger, and my rule. And here we go. Um, so the handler was in, 
So you see they're kind of out of order because um, it's all asynchronous, but you can kind of trace through the log um, what's happened here. Invoke periodically, um, took that trigger and, and fired it and, and called handler for me. So if I look over um, the Bluemix dashboard, So yeah, so here's my, oops, I reloaded it. Um, there's my trigger, there was my rule, and here was both my, my log, my console log, as well as uh, the invocation. And I see that it ran for six milliseconds um, because this was, you know, it's, it's now been kind of warm started. Okay, um, so that's, that's those basic concepts of, um, oops, tear down these resources to make easy and that's just just like I did whisk action create trigger create they've got corresponding um, methods for just tearing them down as well okay so um, that was the the action trigger rule now that's pretty deterministic we know when it's gonna happen but um, uh, one of the key benefits of serverless of course is handling events when you don't know they're gonna happen and so one of the great use cases here is um, if something happens in a database, you know, a new record comes in that you're interested in, um, linking up to that to fire your event. So um, again, there's another repo here. It is called um, oops, uh, OpenWisk Cloud and Trigger. And on Bluemix, um, I provisioned my own instance of uh, NoSQL database as a service uh, called OpenWisk Cloud in here. And it has its own little dashboard as well that you can work with. So um, let's go through this little sample. Um, I'm just going to set some things as environment variables, um, just the instance that, I've, uh, that I had there on, on Bluemix. Um, my database is named as cats. Um, I will automatically bind to the credentials for it using package refresh. Um, because it's on Bluemix, it's discovering the credentials that are out there. So I'm not setting any passwords and, and usernames within the context of this, so it's a little more secure. Okay. And I will um, set up a trigger that listens to that database. It's hooking into this changes feed, which so whenever anything happens, uh, deletes, inserts, updates, um, this will fire. Okay. Okay, success. And now actually something that's going to handle um, the data change. Uh, this is a little more um, complex uh, of an action. Um, so because it, it's probably going to do something asynchronous, instead of just responding with a, a result JSON object, um, I'm going to use promises. Um, so that'll handle some of the, the asynchronous nature of calls to the database that you, that you might be doing based on that data. And if what it's going to do is just look for a new record and echo out what record was added. So, call this process change. Oops. Okay. Create the action based on it. And then, uh, again, unit test it here. So, in this case, I'm going to um, call it with the name of my cat actually my deceased cat, unfortunately, Tahoma uh, with the color of tabby. So let's call it. All right, I invoke it, and the string, a tabby cat named Tahoma was added. And in my, my debug console, I'm also dumping those parameters that came in as well. Okay, so um, everything came in through this uh, params object, and that's, I did some validation on them and, and worked from there. Okay, um, so... We have that trigger for database changes. We have our action that we've tested. So uh, let's link them together. And what this is doing is, is making sure that we have a sequence of downloading the data and then acting on it. Uh, we set up a rule to link the trigger to that action. And um, I'm going to go set up, create a new data record, a JSON object in the Cloudant dashboard create a document. This is my cat's database. So this is Tarball, Tahoma's sister. She's black. So it's obvious, but 
Anyway, so uh, we now have a record that's been created in Cloudant. It's got an ID. And we can see in the, the activation console that that rule um, fired the, uh, the trigger, fired, uh, mapping the action to the rule fired, and we've got tarball, the new data object that came in there. So we can process that as well. Okay, so that's, um, that's how you work with, with data objects. The final thing I'm going to show you how to work with is, um, is uh, REST APIs, really. This is, I think, where the, the key core of a lot of interesting stuff can happen. Um, you know, the auto-scaling, for example, if you have a CRUD API where you have, um, you know, create, read, update, delete, you map each of those commands to a different OpenWhisk action, they scale independently. Um, one of the use cases I think is great for this is, you know, a mobile app for a conference. You know, people are never using it the Sunday before the conference. Everybody uses it right after the keynotes to find out what their schedule is going to be. Midnight again, they don't use it. And that sort of workload. Very, very event specific. And each of those, the get can totally uh, scale independently. Right? Okay. So this is um, our little REST API trigger. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll create a, um, just a method to handle uh, posts. Um, I'm not explicitly working with any HTTP um, concepts in here. It's just this little logical unit. Um, create cat. And what that's going to do is simulate an insert and return, you know, a, an auto-incremented ID, for example. Okay. Uploaded it. Oh, actually, I'll create one for... For the um, for retrieving it as well. This is fetch cat. Okay. Um, and I'll upload those two actions. Uh, what's different here is that I give them a web annotation. This gives them a little bit of concept around um, return codes, uh, things like that, HTTP headers, and I can then invoke. Um, them independently as I did before in a non-HTTP context. Um, let's invoke it. I created a cat named Tahoma. Uh, he got an ID, uh, hard-coded obviously, but came back out. And um, the same with, with retrieving it. So pull it back out. Hard-coded, see Tahoma? Yeah, there's Tahoma. Okay. Um, so that's all just the standard OpenWhisk, but what we're going to do now is map um, some APIs to that. This is the built-in stuff in Linux. But you can get a third-party um, API gateway yourself to map, so, so, such as Zool from Netflix or uh, Kong. Um, here's. Okay. And this Whisk Bluemix step is only required um, in that context, right? So. I'll use functions number eight. Okay. Create my post endpoint. Okay, and I got a um, uh, an API root, an HTTP endpoint. And let's do a fetch cat one. Okay. And we can now invoke those uh, with curl or through the web. Uh, so what I'll do here is um, pull this guy down and just add a param on top of that. Um, cat ID one. And there we've web exposed it. And we can manage now the API gateway around that, rate limit it, um, make it OAuth, uh, do an OAuth handshake, things like that. Um, but again, that's now all tied into the same cost model as, as invoking it. Okay. All right, so those are the, the three demos there, and I showed it all mainly in the, the CLI, but each of those um, I could have also debugged here, you know, found out what was going on with Tahoma in here. I can see all the cost that it was to me, and um, I could actually use uh, a web ID to actually edit the same file and rerun it and test it there. Um, and same with the APIs. Right now that I've created them by command line, I can go in there and, and kind of play with them as well. Um, 
this is where I would set up any sort of other configurations around it, see the invocations I had against it, and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, so those are some of the simplest things you can do with, with OpenWhisk. I hope that helps you understand how you can invoke your actions, what your developer workflow is. There's a whole bunch of other sample applications out there. Um, there's one that I, I built for that, um, that OCR use case, which actually what it does is it reads routing numbers and, and um, payer account information off of checks and, and handles the OCR, resizing images, stuff like that. Uh, that sample is up there. We did that in a, uh, did that in a POC with a, with a large Spanish bank. Um, there's some interesting ones around there invoking uh, drones uh, in, in the insurance industry. So flying around a disaster zone, taking pictures of properties, doing some image analytics on each of the frames. Uh, the same guy actually, he built an awesome um, categorizer for videos. It takes a part of video frame by frame, does image recognition on each frame to kind of categorize by who's in that movie What's the context? What's the rating? Things like that. It's really fun stuff. Uh, and that's all linked um, through some of the resources I have on, on GitHub there. OK. Um, so yeah, uh, as the end user of serverless, right, the best place to start, just bluemix.net uh, openwhisk. Um, eventually, Red Hat's going to have you know, its own platform as well to work with. But uh, this is the easiest one to get started with right now. Um, you can go to openwhisk.org to kind of look at the servers behind the system. Right, if you're interested in contributing to the open source project. Um, we've got, if you uh, go to github.com slash openwhisk, that's actually a, a short URL to now underneath the Apache organization where it's incubating. And uh, there's a mailing list, but uh, we tend to do a lot more communication within the Slack channel. Uh, it's a great place for you know, Bluemix users as well as, or Cloud Functions users, as well as the community to get involved, um, uh, learn about events, learn about the Kubernetes integration that's ongoing. Um, Twitter, of course, and Medium is a great place for, for some of the fun details on the new, de the, the new tools that are coming out, um, the new, um, uh, all sorts of fun stuff. And one of the, I know that this question's come up quite a bit now. Uh, one of the great, uh, one of the most popular articles out there on the Medium channel is really behind the scenes, how this is all happening, um, and how you can kind of tweak, um, you know, your cold starts and, and really get a lot of just understanding what's going on with your code behind the scenes, uh, which is great about OpenWhisk in that you can see what your data is doing as it's running at rest, which you may not be able to see in other platforms. OK. Great. All right, that's all I've got. Hopefully it was helpful. Um, if, if you have any questions, um, you, know, you can find me or, or go over to uh, find me on Twitter or that GitHub repo. And if you have any questions, you know, contact me, join the Slack channel. Um, I can help you do a POC, learn about serverless architectures, how it might help you out. Great. Thank you very much.